Hello, and welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable, the only podcast that dares to be both on topic and on location, no matter where that location might be. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and I am a part of the Gestalt IT community, and each episode we try to bring you the perspectives of some of the luminaries of the IT industry. Uh, We've collected a group of them here for us today, and I'd like to take a moment for them to introduce themselves before we delve into the premise for today's episode, starting with Keith. Hey, how's it going? Keith Townsend, principal of the CTO Advisor. Check out the new website, thectoadvisor.com. All right, Ned? Hey, this is Ned Bellavance of Ned in the Cloud, and I invite you to check out my YouTube channel for a daily take. So, Tim? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Tim Crawford, CIO and Strategic Advisor with Avoa, and you can catch my blog at avoa.com. And Stephen? I'm Stephen Foskett, uh, publisher of Gestalt IT and founder of Tech Field Day. You can find me at S. Foskett on the Twitters, and I do publish at gestaltit.com. All right, thanks for joining us today. Let's jump into the premise for today's episode. It's been an interesting year, to put it as succinctly as possible. 2020 has been a year of rapid change, of rapid developments, and quite honestly, some of the most rapidly changing predictions that we've ever had to deal with in the IT industry. You know that at the end of every year, a lot of companies get together and uh, they put out these prediction videos of things that we're going to see. Sometimes they play it a little bit safe. Sometimes they stretch out there and try to say, well, I think this thing might actually happen. And it's a safe bet that absolutely everybody got everything wrong for 2020, unless you played it really, really safe. We've collected a group of people here today to obviously kind of think about what we're going to do in 2021. But quite honestly, the, uh, the premise for this episode is that predictions are completely overblown. With that being said, let's jump into some of these predictions. Um, I'd like to jump around the horn, and I'd like uh, for our guests to kind of talk a little bit about what they think is going to be one of the big driving trends going forward in 2021 as we start to look at the way that enterprise IT recovers from, well, quite honestly, what has been a dumpster fire of a year. I think one of the trends that we saw was the embracing of remote work. And I think that is going to continue well into 2021 as people continue to figure out exactly what their approach is going to be. And as a vaccine comes available, some businesses may try to rope the people back into the offices. And I think a lot of those people are not going to want to do that or at least not do it on a full-time basis. So rather than just being at home or just being at work, we're going to have that hybrid worker and you're going to need some sort of hybrid solution to support them. So basically what you're saying is the genie's out of the bottle. There's no way you're going to be able to force people to be a 100% full-time in-the-office worker anymore. Well, I I think we've kind of got a skewed uh, panel here that all of us pretty much work from home, so we already know the magic. We already know how awesome it can be. But we also have learned over the course of the year how much we miss in-person events. And that's sort of the equivalent of the water cooler chat or going around the office and having a face-to-face meeting with someone. There's something that you miss when you're 100% remote. So I think while some workers have discovered the magic of working from home, they've also discovered the downsides. So they're going to want to have that, I'm in the office maybe two days a week and I'm remote three. We'll see. Yeah, the follow on with that, one of the things that was big this past year was virtual events. You know, uh, we, uh, I think all of us have virtual event fatigue, especially December, where the beginning of December was a crush of virtual events, and we could all make the excuse that we're going to AWS reInvent. Therefore, we can't go to the IBM, Intel, slash everything else summit. Well, those barriers were removed. Some really great, great things came out of it. Uh, I hosted a virtual event back in April. Uh, Ned was there. He was he presented uh, on networking, hybrid cloud networking, which I think is another topic. But also, uh, there were people uh, within the tech field day community that presented for the first time at a conference, which was awesome. Yet I found myself last night not wanting to go to church last night, and I'm a devout church goer because it was yet another virtual event. So we're going, I think 2021, we're going to figure out virtual events. Uh, the, the fatigue that comes along with, I'm on Zoom or WebEx all day throughout the day, and I need to be on Zoom, WebEx, and et cetera on the weekends because we're having 
a, uh, a graduation party for free and tomorrow night. Yeah, I think, you know, you're both absolutely right. I think the work from home or work from anywhere is definitely going to take hold. Um, There are already conversations amongst uh, leadership that they're talking about either the 322 model or the 232 model, uh, which is the number of days you're remote versus the number of days you're in person versus the number of days you're off. And so I would expect to see that kind of rationalize out. I don't think the extremes are going to be the case across the board, Uh, everybody remote, everybody in in person. Um, But I do think that we'll have a combination of those uh, where it makes sense. But I think in addition to that, it's also caused us to think more broadly around how we use technology, how each of us are buying things, how each of us are engaging technology. You know, it's not as simple as, you know, the traditional ways of, of managing technology. We have to think very differently. And I think it's really kind of pushed some of those boundaries around new and emerging technologies and put into question how much of that legacy tech should we be sitting on. So there, I, I would expect in 2021, we'll see a market shift as, as the economic uh, factors start to stabilize, which first starts with a vaccine. I've said it before, and I've been saying this for for the better part of eight to 10 months, which is economic uncertainty is driven by virus uncertainty. And so once we get virus certainty, that will then drive to economic certainty, which will then give us a clear path for decisions we make around customers, which ultimately is where technology is going to come into play. Yeah, to uh, quote um, my marketplace, uh, you know, the pandemic is the economy. And um, to think otherwise is just foolishness. I mean, the global economy is defined by it right now. Um, I think, you know, to put a positive spin on some of these things, um, you know, one of the things that I've seen happen is that uh, virtually everyone is becoming more comfortable with technology, uh, with video conferencing technology, especially, but of course, with other kinds of technology as well. Um, everyone's becoming more comfortable with working from uh, remote. I don't want to say work from home because that's not necessarily what people are doing. Um, you know, I think that uh, the recent moves that we've seen, the headquarters moves of companies like HPE and Oracle suggest that the uh, pandemic, um, you know, once the pandemic is behind us, we're still going to be looking at a lot of these same trends continuing and we'll see a lot more adoption of technology and not just by technologists, by everyone. You know, I mean, think about, um, you know, all the teachers, all the doctors, all the everybody who's out there using technology on a day to day basis, you know, doing telework, doing telemedicine. And a lot of these folks, I think, are really it's going to find that it's transforming their their use of technology, their acceptance of technology and, and giving them new ideas of what they can do with it, even once the pandemic is behind us. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Stephen. You know, the other piece that I'll just add to that is um, the pandemic has also showed us that geopolitical risk is also a factor that we must consider when we start thinking about technology. You know, too often we get myopic in our own world and we don't think about the the bounds outside of it. But we have to take that into account, whether you're looking at it at a local level, state level, or country level, um, all of those will play a role. And with the most recent events, um, I think we also have to think about the entire value chain or supply chain for employees and customers. So technology is going to play a very significant role moving forward, but there are a lot of complexities that we're going to have to be thinking about. Well, you know, it's really interesting. We've gotten into, or at least I've gotten into these really intense conversations over the years on the value of a network administrator role in Silicon Valley versus the value of a network in a uh, network administrator role in Tampa, Florida, versus the same role in Takate, Mexico. It has been a really passionate debate on kind of the labor side to say that these skills are no are aren't shouldn't be valued any differently based on location, but market factors have told us otherwise. So I'm really interested to see how 2021 becomes the leveler. I think for most of the tech market, we'll see an overall 
evening of salaries across the board, but this will put pressure on some of us that are in higher cost areas, such as San Francisco, New York, Philadelphia, Maryland, et cetera. So I'm really interested to see the economic and social impact as Tim kind of alluded to when, when we're talking about the world, but just in our little corner in the U.S., how this has impacted uh, the IT workforce specifically. Right. And like Stephen mentioned, the migration of companies away from Silicon Valley is obviously happening. We had two big companies moving out to Texas, and I'm sure that won't be the last of that change, especially since they've realized, well, most of our headcount isn't even there anyway. So why don't we just move our headquarters somewhere that's a little more uh, affordable, let's say. I think another major thing that we'll see the acceleration of is the deployment of edge technologies to support the remote workforce. We already kind of saw that happening and all the hype around 5G, but I got to tell you, 5G is a reality. And I can demonstrate that by going about a mile from where I live and getting on the 5G network there, I got 128 meg down off of, the, off of a 5G pole, which is just, okay, that's ridiculous by itself. I think we're just going to see that accelerate across the entire country as these remote workers decide to stay where they are. You need edge technologies to support those remote remote workers. And we're going to see just the general rise of IoT and, and other technologies that also need that edge accessibility. But I think one of the, I agree with you, Ned, to a point, but I think that's going to come over time because, and I'm not sure 2021 is the year that it becomes a reality. I mean, case in point, you said that you have to move, go a mile from your house to get to that 5G pole. You can't sit in the comfort of your house to, to get it. I live in Los Angeles. I live not too far from the beach, not too far from, from the flatlands of, uh, of greater Los Angeles, and yet cell service is incredibly poor, let alone 5G, but just incredibly poor. And so I think it, the important thing there is that 5G becomes interesting in private networks as you start to build out a network, a 5G network for your factory or, or a particular location, but it's not going to be ubiquitous for some period of time. And so I think that's going to be a bit of a hindrance for um, applications that really focus on it across geographies. But to put a positive spin on it, I do think in the long-term edge is absolutely a 2021 aspect and 5G will be a massive impact over time. So one of the threads that, that kind of seems common between all of the predictions that we've heard so far is this idea behind worker empowerment, that the people who work for companies are going to have a much bigger role in determining how their job proceeds in 2021. But I want to look at the opposite side of this coin, because obviously companies need people to work for them and they want to retain the best talent. But as we've seen over a long period of time, companies also have to be able to operate. And one of the th ways that they are able to do that is they're going to start reducing expenses. And we, you know, we've seen reductions in travel. We've seen, uh, you know, putting off projects that may have some kind of a capital upgrade spend or shifting that to an operational expense. But one of the biggest worries that I have is the idea, especially that we're used to in IT, that we're going to start seeing more work being done by individual knowledge workers because as positions are reduced or eliminated in a company, they're not going to be backfilled. Even with a large workforce looking for work or looking for specific kinds of work, like you said, remote work or, or specific kind of location-based things, are we going to see a, a big trend where companies are going to say, all right, I'll let you guys have the flexibility to work wherever you want to work, but this is the workload that you should expect. So like, as you alluded to, Tim, we're no longer going to be working these eight hour days, five days a week on the weekdays. You're going to be working tens and twelves and maybe six or six and a half days, almost like that Silicon Valley death schedule that we're so used to seeing. Only now it's distributed no matter where you happen to live. Well, I, so I think that as the workforce gets distributed, um, and the, the part of the workforce that gets distributed, I think one of the things that we have seen just in the last 10 months, 12 months, is that your, your workday is broken up with other activities, right? Whether it's taking the pets out to, to walk them, whether it's going out and grabbing something to eat for your family. Because um, let's face it, we're, we all have someone at home that is uh, kind of an interrupt point, if you will, using technology parlance. Um, and so there are opportunities, I think, to start understanding that it's not, it, maybe it is a 10 or 12 hour workday, 
But instead of spending two to four hours of that commuting, and I know people here in Los Angeles that literally spend an hour to two hours a day, each direction commuting, each direction. That's a huge time sink. If you start putting that toward the workday, it's a huge opportunity. And if you start talking about it's not 10 solid hours, but maybe I'm doing four in the morning, I take a couple hours to do some other things, and then I do a couple hours and then do some other things and then come back and do another two hours, it breaks it up and makes it a lot more palatable. So, you know, quality of life is definitely going to be a, a factor in here. But the other piece that I'll say is of all the conversations I'm having across the indus different industries with CIOs, nobody nobody is talking about any sort of significant layoffs or, or letting people in the IT staff go. They're looking at opportunities to kind of bring them along long enough that they can get through and kind of weather the storm and get to the other side because the other side, they know they're going to need those people regardless of where they are. And the one thing I'd like to add to this is competition is good. We, uh, we often kind of attribute that same to from the provider side uh meaning you know what the more opportunities uh that job providers provide the better it is for the workforce but the workforce is starting to become competitors themselves each one of us are independent analysts or work for fiercely independent companies small businesses i we we have a uh it hasn't been announced yet, so I won't share who it is, but we had a community member within our tech field day bubble who went to work for a big vendor. They got put upon them that 20, 10 to 14 hour workday. And they said, you know what? I can just do this by myself at home. I've been shown the way I see how it's available. There's marketplaces being created in other industries that enable it. So there is a pushback. The pushback isn't necessarily, you know what, should I go work for VMware versus Microsoft, but should I go work for VMware or should I just, you know what, X key for Steven or Ned, if they have some projects for me on the side and I'll just make a go that way. You know, I, I probably do have something. <laughs> so I could definitely help you out with that. I, I think it's even more than that. Uh, when we think about, you know, remote work is now enabled, which means that companies, in theory, can hire people from anywhere and possibly pay a lower wage. But the inverse is also true. As a worker who's available, I can now work for a company that is situated, situated virtually anywhere. And as long as they're comfortable with me time shifting my work to where it makes sense for me, now my uh, potential pool of employers has been vastly enriched. So if you think about who holds the power and the dynamics there, in a certain regard, if we accept remote work as the de facto, then actually the, the worker's the one who holds the power in that, in that particular situation. So I, I think if companies decide that they want to lay off their workforce and hire a bunch of consultants, which you know, they probably shouldn't because maintaining in-house talent actually does have value, you know, not just for your culture, but also for the functioning and operations of your company. But if they decide they want to do that, then we can all just become consultants. Well, some of us already are and do the consulting work and charge twice as much. You know, but there's another piece to that. Let's talk about the flip side. In the conversations I'm having with those folks, with those IT leaders that are hiring folks, they're going, guess what? I work in the Bay Area. I'm I'm originally from Sal Silicon Valley, so you know that's that's where I have a really strong footprint. And you know, fellow CIOs are all across the board having this conversation around my job applicant pool just widened considerably because now I don't have to worry about trying to figure out how I relocate someone from Hudson, Ohio, and put them into Silicon Valley. Yes, Stephen, I was talking about you, uh, but. I don't have to worry about that. You know what? Your family is there. Your footprint is there. Stay in Hudson, Ohio. That's great. And I now you are a candidate that I can consider because I don't have to worry about relocation. So I think that's you, the most cool thing about all this. And again, I, I don't want to be insensitive to the people who are suffering. We have to keep in mind that a lot of people have lost their jobs and a lot of people are suffering from this whole situation, the pandemic situation. A lot of industries are really suffering and I don't want to be insensitive to that. But um, 
but you know, there is honestly a positive aspect to it. And that's what you're referring to. I mean, uh, you know, we've always been independent contractors, um, at least all of my working life. Um, you know, the idea that you're an IBM man and you stay there for your whole life is just just out the window. Nowadays, you know, um, you know, anyone can can switch jobs and people frequently do. And especially in, in an environment like Silicon Valley, people were switching jobs all the time. Um, this opens up, I think, a lot of opportunity for people in the tech space who are able to, um, you know, kind of grab that mantle of, you know, an independent contributor, somebody who can work from anywhere, somebody who can contribute from anywhere. And that's extremely exciting because as you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's been incredibly uh, limiting that companies would only hire in, you know, major metros or like the hot, you know, cities or, or someplace like that. Um, nowadays, uh, I think people are learning, you know, you can, you know, you can retire to your island in Hawaii and still run Oracle, right? Yeah, I love uh, the aspect of this. And I, I'm going to say the quiet part out loud, because that's kind of what I'm known for, is, you know, the, uh, I think Tim hit the nail on the head when he said CIOs can now go anywhere. If I were still in the traditional job market, I'd be forced to get uncomfortable, if not better, uncomfortable in a way I have to go in a place where I wouldn't have to go uncomfortably. I'm in a big market. I'm in Chicago. Like that's an advantage from the employment perspective to me. Uh, if I'm in Chicago, I don't have to worry about competing against Ned for a job. So I don't have to be as good at Terraform as Ned is at Terraform. However, if they're looking for someone who's good at Terraform, and I'm not that great at Terraform, but I was in Chicago and I was like the best available option, what do I do? And, and, and I, the quiet part is out loud, and this is, you know, us being honest with the people listening to the podcast, that this is going, this is not all a walk in a park. This is going to be disruptive to your career in ways that you did not consider, and you need to consider these ways. If I can now, if I now have to compete against talented people in Mex Mexico, Cancun, uh, third world, who can equally do their job as well as I can, I have to get creative in how I offer value to these enterprises. You know, I'm glad, Stephen, that you brought this up because there is something I did want to mention that all five of us have a responsibility to do. We're all five men, no women on the panel. And one of the things that we've seen as part of this pandemic is it it's actually pushed a lot of women out of the job market um, to take care of kids at home, take care of the household, whatever the case may be. And so one of the things we have to do is we have to work actively and hard at bringing those folks back into the workforce. So definitely don't just look at it as what you can do for yourself, but what can you do for others and how do you help the next person make that next rung up the ladder. There are huge opportunities that we're talking about as part of this discussion, and that's great. But don't forget your brothers and sisters on either side of you, up and down and sideways. They're going to need a helping hand too. And so I want to acknowledge that because I think it's an important piece kind of to Keith's point about the quiet stuff that nobody talks about. This is something we need to talk about and we need to be more open about and candid. All right. One last thing that I want to cover here as we think about our 2021 predictions. One of the things that did not slow down through 2020 was acquisitions. We saw a lot of them that were fueled by a uh, growing stock market, and we expect that to continue as the economic uncertainty settles down. We see a lot of companies that are looking to expand into new areas to develop new customers and things like that. I want to get your take on this, folks. Which industry do you think is going to see the biggest amount of consolidation inside of enterprise IT? Do you feel like storage is going to be bright for consolidation? Do you feel like there's a specific company that's going to go out and start buying lots of people? I want to, I want to see where you guys are, are thinking this. I, so I think the segment that has the most chance of consolidation is going to be AI. I think AI has, we've seen an explosion of companies and some have started to IPO. 
So you have, was it C3, I think just IPO'd. I think we're going to see a consolidation of those AI companies uh, either being scooped up by existing, uh, you know, maybe IBM scooping up some AI companies or something along those lines, or just one of the ones that IPO'd picking off some smaller fish out there that they think would complement their existing offerings. So I think that consolidation is already underway and will accelerate. And the other thing I'm going to say, my prediction is that Nutanix is going to be acquired in 2021. Um, I, I need to jump in on the AI thing because, of course, you know, we, I, I started AI uh, Field Day this year and also an AI podcast this year. And uh, let me just say you are bang on correct, Ned. Those, that, the reason we did that was because AI is coming to the enterprise and it's coming to the enterprise in a big, big way. And the success that companies like Juniper have had with acquired AI um, has just, um, I, every other company, every other company, no matter what space they're in, needs to have AI enabled tools. It's coming, you're right. So I'm gonna go in a different direction. <clears throat> The, it seems like every cloud something startup is selling to the platform group inside of the enterprise. And there's just a mismatch between the number of vendors trying to sell into the platform group. IBM went in there big time with $34 billion acquisition of Red Hat. VMware is there with Tanzu. And everybody's selling Kubernetes, and not just Kubernetes, uh, port works, uh, storage-related stuff. I, I get super frustrated uh, when I hear a pitch from a vendor, and they say, and I ask, what's the, the persona they're looking to sell to? And they say, the platform group. The platform groups that I talk to are still digesting getting OpenStack out of their environment, let alone bringing in a whole nother Kubernetes based or uh, HashiCorp based platform to deliver applications. They, they're, I think they're for the most part saying no MOS and, do, and I love to hear Tim's uh, thoughts about this. Uh, I think they're doing a reevaluation from the enterprise, from the buy side saying, you know what, should we be buying these platforms and in this business versus outsourcing that part of it? And I, I just see that whole part of it, that whole part of the industry collapsing on itself. Yeah, I, you know, I agree with both Ned and Keith. Um, I'll take it in an even slightly different direction, which is to suggest that the folks that are kind of more ripe for disruption are those that are just kind of either bit players or only have a specific feature that they offer. Um, so not just the platform plays, but I think the folks that, hey, we do this one thing, this one niche area, that, that's more of a feature, that's not a product. And unfortunately, there are other factors that are driving that behind the scenes, but to a customer, I can't take one more feature as a product and one more vendor I have to try and figure out how to integrate. And so I think what you'll see is more focus on the bigger players that have a lot of different features to offer. Uh, even if they only cover 80% of the opportunity, it, it's just, it's too costly. So I think the the little guys are going to have to find ways to to find an exit in 2021, partly because of what happened in 2020, but partly because of where things are going in 2021. And then the second piece is anyone that's still kind of playing in that traditional model, traditional stacks, I think they also are ripe for disruption. So, you know, be careful in the traditional infrastructure spaces, I mean, the enterprise is moving up the stack. They've been moving up the stack for several years, and that penchant is only accelerated in the last 10 months. So I would expect in 2021 to see that accelerate even further, and I would just be cautious for the, for the incumbents there. One of the things that I've seen a lot of are products that are intended to bring cloud-like operations down to on-prem and disrupt the traditional stack that you already have, which is probably a loose collection of VMware, PowerShell scripts, Bash scripts, and some poor, sad mainframe sitting in a corner somewhere that's actually making all of your money. I, the product that they're trying to sell now is either a software-defined solution that will give you cloud-like operations, a tool that will give you that, or just fully replace your existing hardware and software with 
some sort of cloud-like thing. And, and I think we mentioned, you know, the Red Hat acquisition and pushing OpenShift, but there's a bunch of other players that are trying to do the same thing. And the big public cloud providers, Google and Google with Anthos, AWS with Outposts, Microsoft with Azure Arc and Azure Stack HCI, they're all going, hey, you love this cloud thing? Put it down on-prem and you'll be even happier. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of disruption as these spending cycles keep going. Yeah, I think there's definitely a market for bringing cloud-like capability on-prem. We're actually doing some research in this area of saying, you know what? There are workloads that that use cloud abstractions but don't need the cloud. If I'm going to have a data center, why don't I have this capability on? And I, and I think in 2021, we're going to figure out what that looks like, whether it's OpenShift or Tanzu or something from HashiCorp, we're going to look at what works and the rest of it will just send out to the public cloud where, where it belongs. And I think to Tim's point, if, if you can't answer that challenge, you don't have much of a future in enterprise IT. This is starting to shake itself out. Yeah, I think, you know, to take that point even further, Keith, I, I would agree. You know, and bringing it full circle, Tom, um, you know, we started this conversation talking about people working from home. And so as that changes the dimensions, and I was just on a call earlier with a group of CIOs talking about this very issue and how they're think, rethinking real estate and rethinking office configurations and how they're, how they're going to do offices, office management. Guess what else sits under real estate? The data center. And so I think it's really going to push people to question, why do I have a data center? And so that doesn't, that's, not a, that's not a stake in the ground to say, hey, I'm giving up my data center lock, stock, and barrel. It's to say, I need to rethink what I need a data center for and really kind of refactor it to be appropriate for maybe those edge components or mid-edge components, you know, leading back into public cloud, maybe because of regulatory compliance or privacy requirements. But it's going to cause people to rethink how they architect things. I don't think everything goes to cloud. I don't think everything sits in the corporate data center using traditional means. But I do think that we'll see a market shift toward people looking for greater flexibility in how they consume those on-prem resources. And we're seeing that from companies like HPE. I mean, even Dell is, is uh, working down that path. And you're right. The public cloud providers are reaching into that space too. They're just taking a they're taking the public cloud and reaching into the on-prem, whereas the others are taking on-prem and reaching toward more of a cloud-like experience with it. I think we'll need both, but in for different reasons. And that refactoring is something I expect to see in spades in 2021. I'm gonna get a little bit nerdy on you. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you guys um, about these high-level concepts, but let's go right down to the hardware. I think that something we're going to see in 2021 is we're going to see the emergence of um, sort of a transformed race for the lead in data center hardware. And I don't mean Dell versus HPE versus Lenovo. I mean Intel versus AMD versus NVIDIA. I think Intel is showing their hand uh, that they intend to not just be a CPU company plus a bunch of things that support CPUs. I think Intel is going to be trying to transform uh, into a company that provides high-end components, including CPUs, GPUs, networking, you know, uh, persistent memory, et cetera. Um, I think that NVIDIA has obviously already headed in that direction. Uh, by the way, I don't think NVIDIA is going to end up with ARM. I think, don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, but I do believe that NVIDIA is going to try to make a run for it as well. And AMD is the third horse and AMD has the most acquisitions to make in order to, to fill that up. So I expect AMD to make a couple of big, you know, blockbuster, many billion dollar acquisitions in that space to try to compete with Intel. I was on a thread where I asked who was the winner losers in the whole, uh, and let's just say ARM x86 with intel and amd and you know people were quick to say intel because amd is cheaper you get better uh uh performance per watt and price etc i'm like yeah that's looking at it from a much too small perspective uh if you look at what 
AWS is offering, they're offering an abstraction from x86, period. Just deploy code. And there's value in that. If you look at Intel, Intel is making the argument that uh, the entire distributed system is a thing that someone should buy and someone should provide. AMD just doesn't have that. And they are by far, in my opinion, the furthest behind as smart CTOs, architects look at their data center strategy and even their cloud strategy and need to figure that out. AMD is not very appealing outside of like niche workloads as opposed to a whole data center system. Let me be more provocative. AMD, NVIDIA, Intel all have the work cut out for them. I think they're all at risk, all three of them. Um, and I don't say that lightly. I think the the challenges for each of them are slightly different. Um, you know, you mentioned Intel. Intel has been a massive software house for a long time. People just don't know it. Uh, and that's one of the problems within Intel is they don't, they, they really need to work toward trying to communicate the value of their portfolio because that is definitely one of their strengths is kind of that edge to cloud capability and then also going the other direction, the other dimension. But let's not count out the custom silicon that's coming into the marketplace through the public cloud providers. I mean, there, there are some amazing things that they're able to do at a completely different price point. You know, we've seen it in other ways uh, in the consumer market with Apple uh, coming out with their M1 processor but I would fully expect to see others kind of chipping away at that market that AMD, NVIDIA, and Intel alike have kind of harnessed for a long period of time. It is up for grabs, and each of them have to make some big moves if they're going to remain viable. All right. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. And quite honestly, I'm sure that with these great guests, we could probably keep talking well into the first quarter of 2021. So we're going to go ahead and, and cut it off here. But I think the most important thing that you should be taking away from this as the audience is that there are a lot of factors that will decide if 2021 ends up being a better year for you than 2020. Obviously, we hope it will, but that's up to you how you choose to invest your time, how you choose to invest your effort, and who you choose to invest it in, whether it's yourself or another company or even a new job. So look at the calendar as a blank slate. Take our advice, take our predictions for what they're worth, and use them to make the next year your best year. If you have a premise for our podcast and you would like to let us know about it, you can always hit us up on our website at gestaltit.com or on our Twitter handle at gestaltit. You can find great episodes of this podcast on our website at gestaltit.com slash podcast. You can find some of the great technology discussions that we have and possibly even some of the predictions that we have talked about coming true over the course of the next year. Um, you can listen to us in your favorite podcast application of, just, of choice. Just search for the on-premise IT Roundtable. There's no extra S on there. And uh, you can always follow along on all of your favorite social media channels. For our great guests and for our family and community at Gestalt IT, we want to thank you for tuning in this year. And we look forward to bringing you more great episodes of the On-Premise IT Roundtable in the years to come. Stay tuned because Gestalt IT will return.